Good evening and a very warm welcome to this evening's webinar brought to you by the Links to Scotland project, a partnership between Trees for Life, the Lifescape project and Scotland, the big picture. Now, we have this evening what I hope and expect will be a very interesting discussion lined up for you, examining the uh, question of how a Links, a, pos a possible future Links reintroduction to Scotland might affect our sheep farming sector, uh, and asking the question whether potential conflict between links and sheep make contemplating such a reintroduction impossible, or whether, in fact, some level of managed coexistence might, in fact, be possible. So my name is Hugh Webster. I work for Scotland The Big Picture, uh, and I'm delighted to be joined this evening by Grace Reed and Fred Swift. Are you there? Hi, guys. Hi. So allow me to introduce our panelists this evening. Uh, Grace Reed is a sheep farmer. She is based in Perthshire. Uh, her family have a long standing passion for pedigree sheep. They also have cattle. They do a bit of arable as well. I understand a bit of everything. Uh, and sheep uh, is the focus, however. And uh, Grace is the regional coordinator for the National Sheep Association here in Scotland. Fred Swift is also a sheep farmer. Uh, and at the same time, he is also a valued partner uh, within Scotland, the Big Picture's Northwoods Rewilding Network. His South Clunas farm uh, up near Inverness is a family-run farm. They keep sheep and cattle. He has uh, 1,000, if I get this right, crossbred Texel and Romney sheep and 65 ling cattle. Uh, but they've also recently diversified into rustic accommodation uh, and outdoor events alongside uh, wildlife and farm tours. So a bit of brief background for everybody on the links, just to give us some context for this evening's discussion. Um, the links is sometimes described as a big cat in a medium sized cat's body. Um, it is small compared to something like a lion. It is more like the size of a Labrador, but it is still very much an apex predator uh, capable of taking down deer the size of a female red deer and uh, even reindeer. Uh, it was exterminated here in Scotland at some point in the last 1000 years. It is difficult to say exactly when with the nature of a cryptic species, making as exact the time of its disappearance hard to pin down and also record keeping uh, patchy, obviously. But there are some suggestions that it may have clung on in Scotland as late as the 18th century. It survives still in Europe today. It has been reintroduced to at least nine countries across Europe. Uh, and it is a specialist woodland hunter where it likes to ambush its preferred prey of roe deer. So here in Scotland, there is growing public interest in a potential lynx reintroduction. Um, but there is also, it's fair to say, uh, some concern about what that might mean, particularly for sheep farmers and hence our discussion this evening. Um, occasionally, that means that this has been a, a bit of a divisive topic. Um, in the public sphere, on social media and so on. Um, and there are farmers who are concerned about this. We'll be hearing more about that, I'm sure. But it's also important to recognise, I think, that there are lots of members of the public who are concerned by the absence of links and who really want to see it back. Um, so we'll be discussing all this. You're free to join the discussion as well. The chat box is open, so you can discuss um, what we're talking about in there. Um, if you have questions this evening, there's also the Q&A panel that you should have in front of you. Uh, we will try and find questions at the end. Uh, what I would ask is um, we'll try and field at least one question each. So if you could preface your questions by writing the name of the person you would like to address the question before it. So question for Hugh and then your question, question for Grace, question for Fred. And then I will come to that Q&A box at the end of our session and, and try and find time for at least one question each. Um, okay, so without further ado then, um, we will get into our discussion and um, to really give us some background and understanding of this issue, if I can come to you first, Grace, and ask, could you summarise for all of us what your impression is of how Scottish sheep farmers currently perceive the potential reintroduction of links? Uh, yeah, thanks for that, Hugh. Um, 
This is by no means the start of this discussion that we've had in Scotland about the reintroduction of links. Um, sheep farmers themselves are very concerned um, about potential reintroduction of apex predators. We already have the seagulls in the west coast of Scotland, which has been a long documented process of the issues that are going on there. Um, the general feeling is that the impacts that links would have on the sheep are completely unjustifiable to farmers when they already work tirelessly for the welfare and performance of their livestock and also maintain their own livelihood. As you know, sheep um, play an important part of maintaining the biodiversity of the current perfectly functioning ecosystem and that would be that would be disrupted by another introduction of an unnecessary predator. It would be costly, complex process with a little benefit to the woodlands and the ecosystems as a whole. And it might be a very kind of out there opinion, but again, it, I think the lynx was deemed to be a species least of concern in the IUCN red list, and it doesn't really seem a necessary proposal to reintroduce again. But then more work needs to be done to ensure that that everybody is fully aware of the positive and the negative attributes to a reintroduction program involving a predator, the potential welfare welfare problems that would arise due to an unsuitable um, habitat that's chosen. And by no means are our members trying to be unreasonable in this discussion. They have had many, many years of dealing with existing predators, like the likes of the foxes, badgers, crows, ravens, just to name a few, and cannot sustain the addition of yet another apex predator. And just to finalise that, um, we had actually ran a, a sheep industry survey at the start of the year. And one of the questions was, what was the, the kind of general feeling of reintroduction of links? One being very unconcerned and 100 being very concerned and the average score was 90. So the Scottish sheep industry that filled in that survey, that would be a very good way of kind of sum summarising how the general feeling is. Do you know what the sample size on that survey was, That where it was... The average score was 90 out of 100 for how concerned people were about the links. Yeah, there's there's a good couple of hundred sheep farmers involved in that. So um, it is a small proportion of sheep farmers in Scotland, but again, it is it shouldn't be diminished, their no, impact. No, no I, would, I wouldn't seek to diminish that, obviously, that and that's illustrative. And you make the case strongly that sheep farmers are concerned. And the concern, I think, for, for, from what you're saying is, primarily based on on the predation risk that um links represent to, to sheep is that, is is that fair there's no there's no other concerns you said something about welfare at one stage there yeah it's, it's the general overall sheep welfare that's involved um if there's guarantee that they won't predate sheep then that put aside a few a lot of the fears that's there but it's also the unintended consequences on on the wider ecosystem not only just for sheep the kind of the, the wading birds all the animals that that they can impact and also the infrastructure for tourism for example there's many angles that can come at which i'm sure we'll we'll go into a wee bit later on yeah okay i mean since we're here and we've raised it now i guess it's probably as good a time as any to address this concern about the predation risk um, and I'm certainly not going to sit here and tell you or anyone else that there is zero predation risk because that would be frankly dishonest. Um, I think if you review the literature of um, lynx around Europe, it is clear that lynx can and do kill sheep. Um, so it would be pointless to deny that and it would be counterproductive in the long run if, if we want to establish coexistence where where trust is so important between farmers and conservationists. I think having said that, I think it is also important to flag the fact that whilst some pro-links advocates have probably been guilty in the past of downplaying that predation risk, I think it is also important to highlight the fact that some people who are concerned about links or opposed to bringing back links have occasionally been guilty might be too strong a word, but been subjected to information that implies the risk is greater than it may be and and so we often see Norway cited as an example of how bad that predation risk can be but there, there are various reasons why Norway is a bad um, comparison with the situation in, in Scotland that, that they manage their sheep very differently I'm sure I don't have to tell you that um, but it's also the case that um, those numbers that get reported from Norway those are unverified numbers so they get reported quite uncritically but in actual fact when scientists have looked at the data and studied individual links and looked at predation rates the, the rates that links kill sheep in Norway is much lower 
than the rates that farmers report sheep being killed by lynx, if that makes sense. So um, those Nor those Norwegian data, they, they need to be treated with caution. And there's also some good news I was recently sent by a Norwegian scientist who, who was keen to highlight to me that in Norway, where roe deer uh, occur at greater than four roe deer per square kilometer, which is not an unusual density for Scotland, often we have actually much higher densities than that. Even in Norway, which is the one country in Europe where they encounter, or at least where they report large numbers of problems between lynx and sheep, even in Norway, where those roe deer are, occur at densities above four per square kilometre, there are very, very few losses. So I'm not going to sit here and say we wouldn't lose sheep to lynx if they were reintroduced, but I would say that we shouldn't be afraid that numbers like those you hear reported from Norway are likely to transpire here. And we should maybe look at some of the more comparable countries in Europe where the rates are a lot lower. Is that is that fair to, to cover off on that for, for this moment in time? All right. Well, on, on that topic, um, maybe Fred, if I if I can come to you next. Um, if we accept that um lynx can and do kill sheep, um, although we hope generally at relatively no low numbers, and we we should remember that lynx being a large carnivore, they do occur at low densities in the, in the landscape. So about one lynx per 100 square kilometers is, is, is about the average density. If we accept that, that we do occasionally lose some, some sheep to lynx, do you think there is a level at which those losses become intolerable? And conversely, is there maybe a level at which losses are potentially tolerable to farmers in your opinion? Yeah, fantastic. Good question. Thank you very much, Hugh. Grace, thank you very much for the points raised so far. Um, I, I'm not sure tolerate's a, a very good word. Um, as as we touched on earlier, um, you know, there are a lot of losses that we get on the farm anyway. You know, we lose two or three sheep a year to badgers. They get caught on their backs. Probably lose about ten uh, to twenty maybe lambs a year to foxes. You know, these things these things we tolerate. These things we have to put up with. Uh, Grace touched on the seagull situation. We're too far over to the east to really fully understand that. Um, I haven't seen it myself. Um, and she also touched on the levels of, I don't know if the right word is anxiety or worry or whatever. You're sort of 90 out of 100 there from your sample size. So I think tolerate is probably the wrong word. I think it's it's got to be, if it were to happen hypothetically, and I have to say I'm pretty much on the fence for all of this, my, my sort of... Uh, natural half says you know bigger picture there could be some amazing ecosystem services and benefits and all the rest of it the potential to reverse trophic downgrading and all this sort of stuff but on the other hand you know we've got a thousand sheep and if they're if they're being killed by lynx every night that's not very good uh for for my family um so i think it's got to be sold as a as a zero tolerance policy um i don't think sheep farmers should be expected to tolerate anything i think that instead of tolerate, there might be sort of words like, you know, thresholds on, on numbers of sheep, um, at which point there is intervention uh, greater than financial. I don't know what you think about that, Grace, in terms of um, where that number might lie, sort of 10, if a farmer were to lose 10 or 15 sheep, um, that might be, you know, is the line about there? Or is it lower than that, or is it greater than that? Um, I also think there needs to be conversations when, around when you have. Sorry, as well. Just when you're talking about a line, Fred, this is a line beyond which what you, you're suggesting that the something should be done about that links or. It, it... Yeah, potentially. I think you've got to be able to have that as an option um if you're going to get people on side you, you you can't expect to say right this this lynx is coming in uh we, we we've seen this with the beavers and now they're protected so you have to now you know dance to our new tune you've got to be able to say you know we're running a trial here we're, we're trying to work as close as we can with the scientists and the land managers on the ground and there are thresholds there are um um you know management frameworks in place at which point there may be intervention options um, and I'd probably say for us at a at a um, farm of a thousand sheep, 
probably about if there was anything more than 15 then i'd like to see some sort of intervention before that i think as you're saying isolated cases and the deer densities we have around us i wouldn't expect that if if the, those numbers you were quoting earlier were to play out um and i think up to that point there needs to be a, a pretty stringent financial uh system in place to compensate farmers yeah. probably involving some sort of photographic evidence because you know you're talking there about the discrepancies about what's reported and what might actually be going on on the ground and i think you would uh, it'd be quite clear a lynx attack would be quite clear yeah. compared to anything else in the field yeah i mean we we can talk about practicalities of managing those sorts of schemes later maybe if we have some time i would just uh it seems worth mentioning that in other countries where links have been reintroduced in France, in Switzerland, in Slovenia, they all have the sort of um, systems you're talking about, whereby there is a threshold beyond which individual links that are identified as stock raiding cats can be lethally controlled, either under license or by um, state agencies that will come and target that individual cat. So there is precedent for how that is managed elsewhere in Europe. And there is theoretically, I'm not in a position to say what would or wouldn't be decided on by nature, Scott, but there is theoretically no reason why that couldn't take place in Scotland as well. And in most countries where they coexist in an uneasy sort of um, sort of relationship of harmony with large predators there has to be some sort of give and take like that and and so my personal point of view is that that would be a necessary management um step but it's the where that threshold is is interesting and for you and i have discussed this previously actually fred about, about you were talking there about what 15 sheep was maybe about where you felt the level was that's what the, the level in Switzerland is if one lynx kills 15 or more sheep in a year, then it can be killed. But I've also heard farmers tell me that if a single sheep was killed by a lynx, that would be unacceptable. That is a, a position that some farmers hold. And personally, I find that a little bit difficult to reconcile with sort of tolerance for the natural world, because as you also mentioned, farmers already lose some sheep to badgers, some sheep to foxes. So if a one lynx was to kill one sheep and that was suddenly that was completely intolerable, I to me that doesn't quite stack up. Can yeah. I come in on that point to you? Please do, um, yeah. I mean any death on a sheep farm that it, it, a farmer's put in so much work and passion into making um their farming business and their livelihood and all the rest of it that any death on the farm is investigated and if it's preventable then that makes it even worse so when it comes to the likes of fred with a thousand ewe flock or somebody that only has 10 ewes and they still have one predation that's maybe the scale that we're coming into that's the great thing about the scottish and the uk sheep industry is that it's not the same for everybody everyone's got different sizes of flocks different um levels of pedigree commercial breeds all the rest of it is so intensive in some places and extensive in others that one sheep to someone might mean a next amount of money compared to someone else that doesn't put much value into it so i know where you're coming from that one it seems very extreme but to that one person one might be that kind of cutoff point that you cannot get over so any death that can be prevented on a sheep farm will be done and in the case of lynx it's yet another predator that at this stage it could be prevented and that's where a lot of sheep farms are coming from yeah i think that that point that you make about one farmer might have a thousand might have two three thousand sheep and, and a crofter might have 10 or just 100 sheep and might know every sheep individually and, and i think there is a, probably a difference in terms of that impact in terms of how that is felt and how serious that impact is. And it's interesting to consider how you could allow for that in terms of how you constructed any sort of compensatory package um, for farmers, wh whether it needs to reflect what percentage of their flock is affected. Um, I think, yeah, that's a very important point. That would have to be built into any sort of future framework. You, you, you've got to be very clear about all of that and how important it is um but yeah losses are losses sheep you know everyone makes the same joke about sheep they stand around the field thinking different ways to die um <laughs> unfortunately well i mean grace my next question for you was 
Can you tell us more about how predation impacts farmers? You, you've touched on it already. Is there, is there more that you wanted to add about the, the particular effects that are felt when farmers lose sheep to predators? Um, yeah, I think so. It's not just the fact that you've lost a sheep or a lamb or um, it's been predated. There's a lot more serious impacts that are felt across flocks, um, less choices for female replacements, less rams, less calves chosen in the, in the long term, um, resulting in an older, maybe even less genetically fit um, ewe that's been kept on the hill. Uh, it's basically an unsustainable farm if there's any losses and um, it can lead to some farmers having to leave the industry um, and that as we all know, impacts the wider rural economy and the schools and everything else that makes up that kind of community. Um, it's, again, it's it's not just lynx predation, it's everything else that it's that uh, snowball effect. There's always, always going to be something else adding on and we can't underestimate how much of the toll that's taken on the national flock. Um, it takes uh, an impact on the mental health of the farmers involved. As I was mentioning earlier, farmers invest so much into their sheep farming flocks or whatever enterprise they have on their farm that they give it their all day in day out and having that devastating impact going out to find the remains of something um it has an untold effect on their mental health and that's even just getting worse the winters are long enough for everything else that they have to do on a daily basis and all the other jobs that they do that that just adds on um also the biodiversity in the affected areas were um we're losing the likes of key waiter species, species, the black grouse, the butterflies. There's so many kind of animals and birds and things in the ecosystem that are affected um, in, in the biodiversity and the farms themselves. Farmers put in so much work to, to try and increase their biodiversity. And especially now that the government are kind of looking at that more, there will be even more biodiversity on the farms and there is, the further change to the agricultural reform and unintended consequences that are emerging consistently in today's climate, we can't underestimate just the whole toll that impact will take. And Scotland as a nation does deserve to have um, the right to see uh, the species of um, biodiversity, but it is it comes down to the national flock that um, maintains the landscape that we live in and the countless benefits to society that we have today. And without them, the whole landscape would look very different indeed. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I think that we risk getting into a, a wider discussion about how the landscape looks. And I think there's probably a variety of perspectives on that. And um, I probably we don't have time to get into all of the complexities of that debate if you like today but just to pick up on a couple of the things you were said you were saying there it, it sounded like you were suggesting that some of the concerns farmers have is about whether lynx might negatively impact biodiversity in terms of you were talking about the black grouse and the waders and what have you and i should be clear that there is no scientific evidence that to suggest that that would be the case and there is quite a lot of evidence to suggest the opposite would be the would be the case so in that regard i think i can confidently put your mind at ease that um it is much more likely that reintroducing a native apex predator to scotland would have knock-on benefits for those particularly those species you mentioned because a lot of them are negatively affected by things like foxes and we know that bringing back an apex predator like the lynx could actually reduce the numbers of foxes or reduce the rate at which they predate on those things because they have more opportunities to scavenge from lynx carcasses. So from the ecological point of view, I think the, the benefits are clear. In terms of the losses for farmers, obviously you make a strong case about how difficult it is, but it I struggle, I still struggle to reconcile this idea that, that even small losses could be critical to the whole industry. And we are talking about small losses, most likely when we when we look at um, the comparative case across Europe. So I sometimes I, the feeling I get is because sheep farming is a hard industry and it is a hard work and there are small margins, as you describe, and it, it's vulnerable to all these international markets. It feels like that is used as a sort of reason for saying any small marginal extra problem would be intolerable even though some of those small losses already are part and parcel of sheep farming so that, i think that's what i find difficult to understand sometimes but equally i don't want to make little of 
how hard and how hard felt those those losses can be for farmers. Um, if if we move on, can I can I jump in there for one second? You just yeah, do speak please to, speak to something that, that Grace said just then, which I've heard from other farmers when we're talking about losses, um, especially when it comes to things like tups and genetics. Those those things really just can't be replaced. You know, turning up with a checkbook is fantastic, but um, a lot of people have worked very hard to get to situations where they've got animals well adapted to their area, to their grazing systems, to their management handling, and all the rest of it. Um, and financial compensation is an option, but uh, you know, I think it's definitely worth noting that genetics are not, and that that's that's something that would have to be discussed at some stage as well. And yeah. I just probably probably agree with you there on, on the biodiversity front i think we can all agree regardless of views on links that there are probably one or two uh too many deer in scotland and if we're going to have something that that helps helps trim the deer numbers down and keeps the potentially the the foxes at bay and the and the badgers on the move then that might be good for especially ground nesting birds you know as farmers we were out in the field every day and you, you see ground nesting birds and, you, and you're seeing their decline and it's something that's quite evocative within the industry and you've mentioned them a few times already grace and i would like to imagine based on my understanding of uh, of how ecosystem would work and how an apex predator might influence those different trophic levels all the way down that it would indeed be positive so from the biodiversity point of view i'd like to imagine that that would be one of the one of the sort of the the, the biggest pros yeah i mean i think anyone with any empathy should be able to sympathize with the concerns of farmers who are worried about losing sheep and it distresses me when when people make light of those concerns on the other hand and this question for fred do you think if um farmers are to adopt and exercise basically an absolute veto on lynx reintroduction saying we cannot tolerate this any losses on top of already what is a hard industry would be intolerable do you think that position creates any risks for the sheep farming industry in terms of the public perception of sheep farming here in scotland if it is the case that the only reason that we cannot have lynx back in scotland is because we cannot have them alongside sheep what what does that how does that leave farmers in the in the public eye? Yeah, I think I think to take a hard no or a hard yes on on anything without uh, appearing at the table and voicing your concern and 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 listening and understanding and trying to have those conversations um, doesn't reflect well on anyone in any situation. Um, so uh, so an absolute hard no, we're not even going to talk about it. As as you said, as I think you were saying there, uh, obviously wouldn't look very good. Um, I also think it it wouldn't be very constructive to the conversation because then you'd be in a at a quite a weakened position to be able to put across your your real concerns and and moving forward if this thing ever hypothetically happens you would hundred percent would want to have a seat at the table um, you know and to be involved in conversations around around compensation and reintroduction and and all this sort of stuff you you want to be involved you'd much rather be there than not um yeah i mean i sometimes think about the sea eagle situation and we and we know obviously there is now some conflict between sheep farmers and sea eagles particularly on the west coast um and if we were to turn back time and go back to the 1970s and farmers were to say because at the time i think scientists quite genuinely thought there wasn't going to be any conflict because there isn't conflict with with sea eagles in other countries um so if they had known there was going to be conflict ahead of time, as we can say with some confidence, there will be some level of conflict with lynx. Um, do you think farmers should have been able to exercise a veto on bringing back sea eagles? Then? Or is it the case that it's just we have to find a way to make it work that is fair for farmers, but also allows for these things to have a place in the native make up of our wildlife was that for me i mean yeah. grace you, well, you i mean jump in big, as well if, if big, you big, big, big picture talking about having a place in the native wildlife you know this whole conversation and our whole lives are are in the in the context of a of a climate and biodiversity crisis that's that's going on so 
if we continue doing what we're doing at the same rate, we're going to continue to see the same decline. So we've got to do something. We've got to try something. Um, and to be part of that is obviously much more important than to be standing objecting it. Um, I think that is a, a, a very interesting point to bring up the seagull situation. And one wonders what the situation would be now and how the public perception would be in Scotland had farmers been dis been part of the conversation in the 70s. Although, as you say, that was through through no one's fault because what we're seeing now in terms of lamb losses um, is pretty much unprecedented anywhere else. Um, so to be part of it is obviously got to be, to be part of the conversation is, is very important for me. Did, did you have anything you wanted to add on that, Grace? Or... Um, yeah, I think, particularly in the Seagull case, I don't think anyone could have um, predicted how successful they would be in terms of breeding pairs and the numbers that we're seeing nowadays, and also the level of predation that is being impact or being felt on the West Coast. Um, which, as you know, there's very many um, options available to farmers to try and mitigate that um, predation and with very few actually working. Um, the problem is that it's the communication element that comes into, I'll go back to the point that you made earlier, Hugh, is that if there was a hard line from the sheep industry and that was the only thing that was stopping the reintroduction of a species, it's that communication po po um, process being put across to the public or whoever it is that we need to be able to say that we have genuine reasons for saying, no, it's not just the fact it's a hard no and being unreasonable. So it's kind of a two pointer there that Again, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. There's a reason why all these here um, species were hunted to um, extinction in the first place. And are we really learning anything the second time round if we were to reintroduce them? I mean, the, the reason is exactly the same as everywhere else in Europe. But with an, us being an island, we were able to exterminate them, whereas they were they were more resilient in the European context. So I don't. I, I'm sure we don't want to maybe appeal to the reasons of the the middle ages for what we how we would want to carry on today but i mean yeah it's it's a it is a difficult one um i mean if i if i was to play devil's advocate and you, you were talking about how you, you were saying um it's not an unreasonable position to say that we can't tolerate links what would you say to somebody a consumer who said well I, I would prefer to live in a world where farmers do coexist with large predators. And so if I'm going to buy lamb as a product, I'm going to try and seek out lamb that is sourced from Greece or Spain, where farmers do coexist with large predators, not just lynx, but bears and wolves as well. And that is the model of farming that I would rather support rather than a model that says we cannot live with these things. Well, if that was the model you were going to, it just completely undermines the whole Scotch lamb brand, to be very honest. But again, if you could get to a level of coexistence where everyone is happy, then happy days. But at the moment, there's a lot of people that cannot see that way, either whether you're from a pro-lynx or an against-lynx um, side of view. There's many, many hurdles to overcome, and we're, we haven't even started the process just yet. But again, at this point, all the concerns should be raised from both sides to be able to potentially... Um, get across them barriers but at the moment we've seen far too many uh, problems with the sea eagles that have been reintroduced and we need to learn from that whether it be an exit strategy or having the means to be able to deal with rogue or juvenile problems yeah yeah, yeah i think an exit strategy is, all, is always a good thing to have i think unfortunately government i don't know if we're going to delve into politics but government has slightly burnt their you know they've slightly um what have they done? They they've sort of messed everyone around with the with the with the beat with the whole beaver thing, saying that you know you're you're will be handing out culling licenses and things like that, and then pulling that away um, as soon as there was a little bit of public pressure. Um, but something like having an exit strategy, or or if there was anything to happen, to be to be calling it certainly a trial uh, rather than a reintroduction would be it would be a good a good way of of saying that this is a little work in progress accepting that we're run, we're running a, a a trial in certain areas to to see what happens and there's always a an exit strategy i think grace raises a good point with that you're not you're not going to win people over especially sheep farmers by saying by running a hard line on it yeah and just just on that sorry Hugh, the a lot of the times what is deemed to be a successful reintroduction there has to be that threshold as well whether or not it's a problem 
we were talking about earlier about a threshold of having um, 15 sheep or however many killed. What is deemed as a su successful reintroduction? What does it look like? We're not just plucking uh, numbers out of air. So again, whether it's a, the exit um, strategy, there has to be clear guidance amongst kind of any reintroduction as well. Yeah, and uh, and I think clear parameters about what success and failure look like, and so yeah. that everybody knows from the start what the what the target is and what the situations that everybody wants to avoid are and how those will be managed. I, I agree. I think in a, in a we should all agree on on that absolutely. Um, I'm reluctant now to ask this question because Fred referred to it as that old joke, but um, uh -oh. a, a local farmer did recently say to me that a, a sheep there are 99 ways to kill a sheep and a sheep knows 101 and this phenomenon of um that sheep do have a habit of dying fairly regularly um question for grace on this then really is, do you think it's easier psychologically for a farmer to accept the death of a sheep when it is due to something like disease or an accident compared to when sheep are lost to predators short answer no um no death is acceptable i would say and and any it takes a um it goes back to that is it preventable or not we try so hard to keep sheep living try to keep any livestock living you try so hard to keep your crops growing everyone has tries their best in whatever business or form of work that they are to do their very best and make sure that it goes well um, when it comes to a disease, there's many things that can't be prevented. Well, look at COVID, how, how far it spread, even in humans, for example. I'm not by any means trying to downplay anything, but there's some things that you cannot get over or cannot prevent. And when it's predation, when you see your sheep or you come out in the morning, your lamb, your hours or minutes old lamb being taken by ravens or crows, that can be prevented. And it, it's, it doesn't get any easier to see um, it happening no matter how many times you've seen it or if it's the first or the hundredth time um, and as call comes down to prevention Fred I jump in on that one I think I think the question was sort of more about obviously in an ideal world you, you wouldn't have any losses but you know that that relative um, that disparity between you know what's what was more acceptable and what's less acceptable but I certainly think that yeah loss to, to predators is 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 worse you know that's something that you can't control you come out in the morning and there's a, there's a fox or whatever and that's happened out with your control versus you come out in the morning and something's killed over with staggers and you think well that's my fault um you know i didn't get my magnesium right uh this year and so therefore you think yeah that was probably more on me versus you know there's a fox you know bloody hell let's go get the light and, and camp out all night and see what happens um, so I think speaking to that, yeah, loss loss to a predator is is definitely greater. You know, it's out with your control. And also just coming on that that even in the the seagull kind of predation side of things, it's not just the the weak or the injured animals that have been taken. It's sometimes very healthy animals that that disappear off for whatever reason it is. So I think there's a mis kind of conception that it's always going to be the the the, the one that's ailing that's going to be taken. And that could be the case in any kind of future predation side of things. Yeah. And I think, I mean, it's an interesting, you, you talk about how it's not always the, the ailing animal. And I think that's probably particularly the case with sheep worrying when you've got domestic dogs attacking sheep that they're not targeting sick animals in particular. They're just attacking the whole flock, aren't they? And um, I understand that that is a, a huge problem here in scotland and across the uk but again i look at the numbers and you can look at the the numbers of sheep that are lost to sheep worrying as i understand the estimates are somewhere between 15 and 18 and a half thousand sheep a year can be lost to sheep worrying in the uk when you talk about disease when you talk about those other predators like crows corvids in general foxes badgers i just i find it hard to um understand how a few hundred sheep on top of that that might be lost to lynx would make a critical difference and and so that's when i sometimes wonder whether the amount of fear around lynx is proportionate to the real risk that would be involved 
I think it comes back down to hot spots, and again, that snowball effect that you might have one one day to to uh, badger one to a fox that it just snowballs. Um, yeah. And no matter how how you look at it, a death is still a death. Yeah, and you're you're hundred percent right to to talk about hot spots and my understanding of where there is conflict with links in Europe, it, it is does tend to be a clustered phenomenon. And so there will be certain farms, and it's probably, I think, the same with sea eagles, where it is clustered around certain farms where they have big problems and another farm down the road might have no problems at all. So you have to have management structures in place where you, you can really help out those guys that are being negatively affected. Um, but at the same time, it should mean that most farmers are not affected um, often at all um, in, in a lot of the places where links have been reintroduced. Um, okay. Um, Grace, another question for you. Um, most countries in the world do support um, at least one large predator now, uh, in particular with all of the reintroductions and the range expansions in Europe where large predators have made a significant comeback. Um, Often those countries are poorer than Scotland when you look at countries that are coexisting with large predators in, say, Africa or parts of Asia. Um, often those predators are more challenging than lynx in terms of not just posing a threat to livestock, but also sometimes a threat to human life. Um, do you think, given all of that, given this global picture, what do you make of the moral argument that says that if Scotland wants to make the case that we are serious about biodiversity conservation, around the world we need to walk the talk as it were and if and if we are not prepared to do so then it sets a bad example in terms of we're effectively open to the accusation of hypocrisy you need to live with lions you need to live with tigers but we're not prepared to live with lynx i think we have an obligation to what's already there at the moment so we have this kind of structure that's already set up um the uk has uh, more sheep than any other uh, country populated currently by lynx and um, as well as the difference in farming systems and husbandry that's there um i would say we are in becoming increasingly concerned about the contradictions which can arise from government policy um, in terms of incentivizing habitat creation and improved animal welfare whilst on the other hand encouraging species reintroduction which could uh, negatively in fact impact the the biodiversity the habits we already talked about and also the animal welfare itself it comes down to what you kind of deem successful and what you want to get to and where you want to come from and again how can you there has to be clear guidance on all this how can you start at point x and get to point um, y without undoing what you've already done before and upsetting what is already there it's a very very fine line to keep a balance and all this stuff and i can i can see where you're coming from with, for the biodiversity kind of side of things but we need to enhance what's already there and who's to say that if we introduce, introduce links now 50 years down the line we'll say well that was a bad move and we've already lost so much more biodiversity and we've undone what we're trying to achieve in the first place yeah i mean uh i think as i said earlier i would say with confidence that they are going to have positive ecological effects um i think I take your point about farmers being under pressure to deliver different things and and predation can be a nasty business. And when you're talking about farmers under pressure to deliver welfare increases and then you're talking about reintroducing a predator, that those are apparently contradictory um, goals. So I take your point there, but there are life is full of these contradictions, isn't it? And, and they, they reflect the fact that we are trying to achieve different things. Um, and so that there are compromises to be made. Fred, can yeah. I ask you, I think I am right in saying that a lot of farmers feel quite conflicted about issues like this, where on the one hand, you have your interest in nature and biodiversity conservation and what have you, but then you have the quite natural concerns about, yes, I would like to see links back for those reasons, but I am concerned about my uh, sheep, my family's interests and so on. What are the benefits that you perceive potentially from a lynx reintroduction? Um, 
if any yeah well i mean we, we've touched we've touched on the biodiversity stuff and uh i think a few, i think a few times now so that's that's all quite clear in terms of that sort of trophic cascading of having an apex predator again in a tr trialed and controlled environment with a potential exit plan if if needed if things start going going belly up um I have to say, as a sheep farmer, I don't think I'm under any illusion that my sheep are incredibly good for biodiversity. That's, in fact, why why we have cows and we, and we use our cows in our um, agro-environmental grazing schemes and, and mosaic management and things like that. Uh, sheep haven't been here very long, have they? So I don't, I'm not entirely sure that the the health, the healthiest in, uh, environment biodiversity and ecosystem habitats in Britain were were in the presence of sheep. I'm certainly under no illusion about that. Um, but but in terms of other benefits, um, obviously ecotourism. I've got, I've got a friend who, who goes out to Norway, spends thousands of pounds going out to Norway every year or every second year and lying in the snow trying to trying to see lynx. I think the the fact that they're very difficult to spot um, is fantastic for, for a tourism point of view because he's never seen them yet so uh plen plenty of footprints and all the rest of it but he's never seen it um i also think you know a, a big benefit would be as you say what did you say earlier uh walking the talk you know i, I have to say I, I got very excited when nicola sturgeon was the, was the first sort of global leader to, to say right there is a there's a there's a biodiversity crisis and i thought fantastic here we go uh, we're we're, we're going to look this one straight in the eye and then followed up by by changing absolutely nothing so i think scotland has a bit of an obligation to to lead you know i think we have you know an opportunity to to take action and we're talking about it like this is something new but when did they start doing links for introductions in europe in, in the 70s uh i think i think i'm right in saying so you know i think i think it's a fantastic opportunity um to, with with a lot of benefits with a lot of downsides as well and, and we've touched on those um i don't know grace do you think there are any potential benefits at all to to links being reintroduced not particularly at the moment no um and that's a very extreme view to put on it but again there needs to be more of that kind of balanced viewpoint coming in to say well this is what you could have and with the assurances that it won't be negatively impacting the sheep farmers. And again, also, if you're looking at biodiversity and the habitats in, in silos, you also need to look at food production as well. We can't underestimate just how we need to be secure in our food production in Scotland and the UK as a whole, and with all the other global impacts that have. So we can't look at any of this in isolation when you can look at the whole picture, the holistic view of things. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you, Fred, talk about tourism as a benefit. I mean, obviously, with your diversification on the farm, there are benefits to more tourists. But do you think, Grace, it's fair to say that tourism in general, I'm aware it's a double edged sword and there are definite negative aspects for farmers and for communities in rural Scotland. But tourism is also a really important source of revenue in Scotland. It's a really important source of jobs. It can and in creating those jobs and in establishing that revenue, that can help sustain rural communities. It can keep the pub open, keep the shop open, keep the school open. So if you've got an animal like lynx, which undoubtedly would attract a lot of attention from tourists, there can be benefits for farmers in terms of the benefits to their communities that flow from increased tourist revenue. There is, yes, there's, there is positive and negative. You can get your agritourism, you can get your, look at how successful the North Coast 500 is and the Southwest 400, whatever they call it is. There's so many benefits to that side in terms of money, but also the negative impact of it as well. You haven't got the infrastructure for a lot of these roads. You're, you need to get people to pick up litter. You have to be responsible in accessing the countryside. You mentioned um, sheep worrying with dogs. There's so much responsibility needed for all these things. And I don't think we're at that stage yet to be able to promote um the the general public in that in that manner. We need to be careful about that balance. You were talking about sea eagles earlier and the impact of tourism on those. They're they're not as um as elusive as a lynx, I'd I believe, to be able to sight a sea eagle. But again, there's many, many trips taken across to Mull or to the west coast to see a sea eagle and they're never found. And a lot of that money doesn't actually make it back down the, the supply chain into the farmer that has to deal with the impacts of these things. So when you're coming back to maybe compensation, all that kind of stuff, 
it's a very very hard one to stomach um from our side so again there's positive and negatives yeah and i can say from my prior work in um as an academic in human wildlife conflict that's not unique to scotland at all that that idea that there are benefits from living with these things but that the costs are unequally um distributed and the benefits not correspondingly shared it is it is quite a common one worldwide where farmers often get the short end of that deal in terms of they bear most of the costs and they only see a fraction of the benefits so um fully recognize that problem but then it comes down to how you manage it doesn't it uh, and how those schemes are organized so for my final question then grace if we were ever to reintroduce um links to scotland it would likely it would have to have some sort of management scheme akin to the seagull management scheme but probably more involved um possibly involving conservation payments such as have been used in scandinavia to compensate people for the costs of coexistence up front possibly involving compensation for direct losses um do you think ultimately that if we were to have a scheme like that it would facilitate farmers being able to coexist with links or if not what would ever make that possible i think there's two things mentioned there so you've got the management scheme and also a compensation scheme so if you're looking at a management scheme it, it supports the flock management to equip businesses to manage and mitigate the kind of any impacts of a, a reintroduced species who pays for that that's the problem where does all these budgets come from where does the money actually come from in terms of a compensation process, you cannot just throw money at the thing and expect everyone to be happy. Uh, Fred mentioned earlier, you've got genetics there, you've got a whole history of generations upon generations of breeding, not only for the animals, but also the stockmen and women that work with them. So there's a lot of things that can be lost there. Um, for example, the Sea Eagle Management Scheme, I think in 2015 and 16, that budget was about 72,000. In 2023, it had rose to 315,000. And I think it takes about 190 farmers at the moment. And that's only getting bigger and bigger with the, the expansion of the sea eagles to the northwest and east and south. Again, with links, if you reintroduce them there, they're not just going to stay in that area. And of course, more and more people will be impacted. But how do you try to mitigate that um, spread of animals and people involved and budget for it? Again, serious agriculture damage. It's so hard to to be able to um, prove that it's there. An awful lot of evidence goes into the eagle management scheme um, to try and prove that it's there. And it's difficult to manage and control the juvenile and problem animals or birds that we're seeing. And again, there needs to be so much more uh, a higher level of consultation and engagement with the agricultural community in these things um, going forward. So that's maybe something that could change going forward if there's a coexistence. But at the moment, there needs to be so, so, so much more involvement um, to get to that stage. And we mentioned earlier that there has to be clear guidance of when's enough enough. There has to be an exit strategy. There has to be kind of thresholds for all this kind of stuff. I don't think compensation is enough. And what 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 do you have in terms of control measures? What can you actually do at the end of the day as well? Because we have to live alongside these um birds at the moment. Links in the future, again, it has to be outlined. Yeah. Um. I mean, just on the the one issue of the the, the money and where, where does the money come from? I guess it's worth pointing out. You talk about the current seagull management scheme budget being just shy of four hundred thousand pounds, somewhere north of three hundred thousand pounds. That obviously comes out of government funds, that comes out of the taxpayer, ultimately. But it strikes me that the amount of revenue that seagulls generate for Scotland, if you look at the figures that are quoted just for Mull alone, where they talk about five to eight million pounds per year going into the Mull economy. And a lot of that is pounds that have come from out with Scotland coming into Scotland. So it seems like the funding question, it, it would be a net positive in terms of the economic gain to me. So part of the answer would be, that funding could come from government. Part of the answer might be that it comes from philanthropic donors. I, I don't know, but just I just wanted to respond to that one question. Right. Yeah, just, just in that, the, sorry, for, um, Hugh, the funding just never seems to be enough. Yeah. At the minute we have that seagull management scheme, it's just never enough to be able to get right on the ground. And I can see where we're coming from that one nest in Mull, for example, will cover the whole of the seagull management scheme as it currently stands. But again, it's a hard fought battle to be able to get that money in the first place and actually get it onto farms. 
yeah make ha having farmers voices heard and realizing that the costs definitely yeah I, I fully accept that um okay i'm going to try and figure out the um question box uh so there's supposed to be a rating system where the most highly rated questions float to the top um so i was going to try and pick those uh right at the top i've got a question for both grace and fred um let me try, let's see what we've got there is there an appropriate place i can reach out to sheep or cattle farmers of scotland to request interviews or send out a survey grace do you maybe do you want to um, respond to that where where's the best place for somebody who wants to reach out to lots of sheep and cattle farmers uh, if you want to speak to sheep yeah if you want to speak to sheep farmers get in touch with the national sheep association we, we do send out surveys on behalf of other people so um you will be able to find my contact details on the nsa website and i can get that through to our membership the other one and um, there's many other organizations in scotland but if you want sheep farmers only come to come to us thank you very much um, Fred, this was also to Grace and Fred, but I guess it's your turn. There's a question. Have you used or thought about the use of Pyrenean mountain dogs I mentioned, like, I guess, livestock guardian dogs in general, as, as if you were to face lynx in your area in the future, how, how would you feel about using um, these sorts of guardian dogs to protect your livestock? Would would that be vi viable for you? Or are there issues there that you... I think it, it would certainly be something you... These would be the, the sort of tools you'd be reaching to you'd be reaching for wouldn't you uh these things that have obviously worked worked in the past i've also had conversations around people who who have donkeys as well in their in their flocks for for the same defensive purposes i wonder if they work better on things like things like wolves in america and, and mainland europe versus the the way that lynx prey i'm i'm not sure you but you definitely have to wouldn't you You'd, all of a sudden these things there'd be a roaring trade in them quite quickly there'd be donkeys being driven north uh, <laughs> flat out and pyrenees dogs as well yeah it's something you'd, you'd definitely consider but again as grace said who, who's who's paying for that where's 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 dog feed where's training these things we all know how expensive dogs are now since covid um but as grace says you know would would, would that be built in who's paying for that would the pockets be deep enough the, i mean the the precedent for that is pretty clear that um those livestock guardian dogs and they're not cheap I, I, i'm not certain of my numbers but i think you, you you can you're talking hundreds and hundreds and possibly a thousand dollars north for, for some of these trained dogs um in other countries where they use these animals i know that there's eu funding obviously we can't make we're not able to access that anymore but in other places there are charities that basically because they are concerned about the predators they raise money for farmers to have those livestock guardian dogs so there are there are systems for for how those things um operate um and so i don't think it would be difficult to raise funds to pay for livestock guardian dogs whether you would want them on every farm across scotland i think that would probably be it would be more likely that we talked earlier about how these problems tend to be clustered you tend to get areas where there is a particular problem so it'd be more a case i imagine of targeting what would be an expensive limited resource to where there are established known problems i, I would guess um there's a question for me then what might sheep losses to lynx in Scotland be compared to other losses that occur already? Um, I don't, I'm not able to give specific numbers on that, but I, as I think we we sort of referred to earlier when we, we talk about the sheep worrying statistics, when we talk about losses to disease and accidents, th those numbers dwarf the likely losses to um, lynx. However, as Grace, I think made very clear, that doesn't mean that those losses are unimportant and and for individuals they could they can be devastating um so we, i think we have to stress how important it is that we would have a system that um fairly dealt with those farmers and allowed them to um mitigate that conflict as much as is possible um maybe one more question um th this is for, for both panelists from uh dave gorman at university of edinburgh he says, if you didn't have a financial interest in sheep, would you support Link's reintroduction? How do you how do you feel about that? After you, Grace. I think if any farmer solely relied on financial in terms of farming, they wouldn't be doing it. Um it, it, you should farming brings in so much more than the financial side of things. You just don't do it because it makes money. You do it because it's the way of life, it's a livelihood, it's, it's built upon generations of um input and what's been passed down the generations so 
from my own point of view, I I still wouldn't support it because it, it's it's a more holistic approach. It's not just more into the financials. Fred, yeah, I think I think I'd be uh, I'd be leading the charge. <laughs> yeah, I'd be I'd be going out to Norway and 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 uh, and trying to rugby tackle links and bring it back. Uh, but obviously, well, no, I'm obviously joking. But in terms of a bigger picture thing, and we're talking about the whole context of of, of biodiversity and climate crisis. You know, what should we be doing? How should we be acting? We should be leading. We should be trialing. We should be trying to create what recreate what was already here before we stuck our grubby paws in and, and got involved and, and, and brought over sheep and all these other things and, and got rid of many things like beavers and, and, and lynx and, you know. And and bigger things than that, wolves. Although I think that's that's pretty ridiculous. But just on the on on the lynx thing, I think absolutely. I think there's a lot of Scotland which doesn't have much sheep and has got a lot of potentially ideal habitat further north in the woodlands. And I definitely think it's certainly worth a trial. If, if Nature Scott or someone were to were to say, look, we're gonna we're gonna trial this. We don't pretend to have all the answers. We're we're gonna we're gonna run this. We're gonna keep the comms open. We're gonna keep as transparent as possible. Um, you can turn it around as well, right? It, I think it's interesting to think. Well, what if you, those people like me who are keen to have links back, maybe we should be thinking if we had sheep, would we be as keen? So I think Dave Gorman's point was, would you be keen if you didn't have sheep? Well, what would we be as keen if we did have sheep? And just to help build that empathy and make sure that everyone is really trying to consider all of, all of the angles. So it's important to put yourself in other people's shoes, definitely. Guys, Thank you very much for taking part this evening. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure and um, I hope you've got something from it. It's, it's been very interesting from my point of view, but um, yeah, just allow me to extend a very sincere thank you for your time this evening uh, and for answering my questions. Uh, I'm sure everybody has appreciated hearing the perspective of you guys from within the sheep industry and being so open to to all of these questions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having uh, you. Cheers team. It's been a pleasure. If uh, if you aren't a sheep farmer uh, and you've been listening to this, I hope it's given you some, um, some food for thought about uh, maybe understanding a bit more about farmers' concerns this evening. Uh, and if you are a sheep farmer, I hope this evening's discussion has maybe given you some encouragement that um, the situation could be managed, that there would be benefits that could be uh, accrued for Scottish society and for Scottish farmers from bringing links back. Uh, and that is all from me. A very good night. Thank you for uh, taking part. And um, if you want to know anything more uh, about uh, the issue, can I direct you to the Links to Scotland uh, website? You can also have a look at the uh, links and us book which is still available as an ebook um the hard copies now i think i'm afraid are sold out but you should be able to um find the ebook as a download on the scotland big picture website and there is also the links to scotland uh, page on there which is at www.links to uh, www there on the screen for you now www.scotlandbigpicture.com forward slash links dash to dash Scotland. So go there, check it out. There's more information available. Um, or of course, follow us on social media. Um, and that's all from me. A very good night. Thank you.